not sure how I feel about this. This is my second shot at doing this video. Hello again. It is Paul. First of all, thank you so much for joining me on this journey from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, we took a little bit of a turn over to Egypt. And we're coming out of Egypt, or we came out of Egypt, about a year later. And now we're taking a, a taking, getting ready to take a walk. But before that, uh, it's, uh, it's really all about right now putting things in order. So this is Order of Things Part 2. Second video, you're never, probably never going to see the first one. <laughs> Had some sound problems. Um, at this point in, in the journey uh, in the book of Numbers, we talked about um, Aaron, Moses, and the 12 princes. So we're going to touch on chapter 2 just a, a smidge mainly to set up how God has instructed them on how to arrange the camp because they're going to be mobile. They've been stable for the last year, but they're about to go mobile. So there are directions on how to set up the camp. And by the way, this is for my grandkids, my brothers and sisters in Kenya, and whomever listens to these videos, if this is a blessing to you, God bless you. The focus here, even though this is about Aaron, Moses, and the 12 princes, is really the Levitical priesthood. They weren't numbered initially. Uh, but in Numbers 3, there is some emphasis on their role, the role they're going to be playing. And I think also somewhere in um, chapter 4, there's a role that they play specifically. Now, first thing that comes to my mind is... Why all this emphasis on the Old Testament? Are, are, are we in the New Testament? Uh, it's all old. <laughs> it's, all, it's all old. But I'll say it like this. When I was studying the works of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God in the New Testament, I did not understand, and I'm talking about over a period of years, I didn't understand how he did what he did uh, until I started reading the Old Testament. And I realized what the scripture says that he came to fulfill the law means that he was a rabbi that understood the law. He was a Jewish rabbi. He was never called a Christian. Now, before I get slapped around, which is cool, because I don't mind being slapped around by, I'm not going to say that. I don't mind being slapped around, because I know, I know my truth. <laughs> which is the spirit of truth. Uh, yeah, before that happens, I think it's very important to understand that uh, Jesus came to fulfill the law as a Jewish rabbi. And uh, Christianity began after his death about 11 years prior to. So the information that he created in his walk was based upon the Old Testament. One of the challenges was these priests were taking advantage of the people and uh, and weren't necessarily living according to the law, which they could never live by anyway. So Jesus came to fulfill the law. 
what I've noticed is that we focus in more on people than what he came to fulfill. In other words, the statutes that he lived perfectly out in his life through his ministry of roughly three and a third years. Roughly. Uh, that he mastered. We don't focus on. We want to focus on personalities. And it was never about personalities. It was always about saving souls. Souls. Not religions. Not people groups. There's neither Jew nor Greek. Uh, but we want to ignore that there was order to what he did. And you can't do that, in my estimation. The order is shown through the hand of Moses. And the main reason why is because God spoke to Moses, and Moses trained Aaron and taught him how to lead through the Levitical law. And then we can get into the different priesthoods, the priesthood of Joshua and the priesthood of, uh, of, of Levi. We're on our way there. That comes next. <laughs> but for now, we're studying these laws that God, that God spoke into Moses' life that emphasize how to raise up leaders who follow God's statutes. Say it that way. Yeah. So statutes are very important. How we treat people is very important. How you treat people is a reflection of your relationship with God. One of the things I'm sensitive sensitive to is not receiving the whole story. When I think when you when you start studying certain aspects of the Bible, you can pick up when you're not receiving the whole story. What does it mean not to receive the whole story? The intentions of the heart. The intentions of the heart. I look back on my relationships and I realize that I've had bad intentions, maybe not trying to, but I've had bad intentions. I had to repent of that. In other words, I had to work on becoming a better person so that my bad intentions could not further harm me because I've made some really bad mistakes. I don't want to live and die based upon my past experiences. I want to grow. In doing so, you need to learn a better way. And Proverbs says, I am the way. The truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me. Who? Spirit of truth. There is a way in the truth. There is a way through the life if we're willing to repent of our ways. Where's that scripture? Is that in Proverbs somewhere? Someone help me with that. Type that in the comment section, section where that scripture is. Numbers chapter 2. Now, <coughs> excuse me. In Numbers chapter 2, there uh, Moses is, is being taught how to set up the camp. Numbers 2, verse 3. Let's start in verse 1. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, so Aaron was there too, saying, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. Now verse 3. And on the east side towards the rising, rising of the sun shall they of the standard of the camp of Judah pitch throughout their armies and Nashon, the son of Aminabad, Aminadab, captain of the children of Israel. Now, I'm not going to, the children of Judah. Now, I'm not going to bore you with all of it. That's the reason why we're not going to read all through chapter 2. But how it goes is Levi is in the middle. And on the north, there's Dan and Asher, Dan, Asher and Naphtali. Uh, on the east side, as it just said, is Judah, Ishakar, and Zebulon. And on the uh, west side is Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. And on the south side, south side is Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. Around the, the tabernacle of the congregation and around the tabernacle of the congregation lives all the Levitical priests. That's the setup. Now, why is that significant? Because it is the order of things. Do I understand it all? The answer is no. Some people say it was set up like a cross. I don't know if it was set up like a cross or not. But I do know that God had a reason and has a reason for the order of things. Now, as we go into chapter 3, God is showing us, I'm depending more so on my notes with this, in verse 2, uh, chapter 3, verse 2, God, uh, it says this, in ver actually started verse 1, context, these, the generations of Aaron and Moses in the day, the Lord spake with Moses in Mount Sinai. I think it's because now when it says these are the days of Moses and Aaron, I, I believe it's because two things. Number one, they were family um, and um, at the same time, Moses, the old guy, was training Aaron, the old guy, in these things as it pertains to the Levitical priest. Verse 2, and these, the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab, the firstborn of Benahu, uh, Eleazar, and Ithamar. The two older sons died, remember, offering strange fire, I believe, somewhere in the book of Leviticus. And as they offered strange fire, uh, Aaron held his own, calmed down, and then hired the nephews to come in to take the older sons out with their coats all still on. And I thought that was significant uh, because, uh, uh, for, well, main reason why I thought it was significant is because their coats weren't stripped of them. Um, in other words, once, you, once you've been anointed, you've been anointed. And once you've been appointed, you've been appointed. And I think that's significant. God does not change his mind. God was not the one in the wrong. They were aware that they were offering strange fire, in other words. They did it on purpose. Now, the commentary says that there is no, there is no uh, understanding of that. But you got to give God, and see, this is, I love the word. So you got to give God the benefit of the doubt. He didn't kill him for no reason. They did something that they knew was wrong, and they were trying to lie to God. They offered him strange fire with the incense and the censer. And 
I personally believe they lit the fire from from the wrong table, but that's or the for the wrong thing where the offering because it was an incense table. I believe they lit the fire from somewhere else where they make the burnt offerings. I personally think that was it, but I think they got burned trying to do it the wrong way. <laughs> Can I say it that way? You know, it, it only makes sense because. That's how we get burned. I've been burned doing it the wrong way. Verse 3. These names of the sons, Aaron the priest. Now, th this is what I want to point out here in, uh, in, in Numbers chapter 3, verse 3. Uh, three different points. They were appointed priest, anointed, and ministers in the priest's office. Now, if you're not paying attention, you would think that it, it just all sounds like the same thing, but it's not. You have to be anointed to be in the priest's office. Some people are in the office of the priest, and they're not anointed. Now, you can argue with me, and but it only makes sense. Some people are doing jobs they're not supposed to be doing. Some people are so, and, and you can take this even outside. You can even take this outside of this. You know, for years I did a job that I, I did, you know, when I was in sales. And I learned a lot. And I raised my family and all that. I learned, I learned some skills, uh, but it cost, it, it caused me some physical harm and mental anguish because I did not like sales. I, uh, I learned how to overcome objections. I learned all kinds of things, but it was a false confidence which made, really made it arrogance because all my responses to all the objections were staged. If you said one thing, I had a response to it, but it wasn't. So it was only after I knew it was time for me to leave the automobile industry because I love the six-figure income, but I became really harsh towards people in my responses. I would say things like, it doesn't matter to me. You know, you're doing X, Y, Z, well, you need this, that, and the other. Now, what was interesting is the more honest I became, the more successful I became too. <laughs> but it, I had migraine headaches all the time. I was working 12 to 14 hours a day. I was out of order because I was working for the money. I was stressed, made a, made, a, you know, in my, you know, world that I came from, I was making a lot of money. I walked away from that in 2017 for the final time because I had walked away before because I wanted to be in ministry. I've always wanted to teach. This, I'm doing for free because I love it. I love studying the Word of God. I love teaching it. I love doing the research. I love moving at my own pace. But when you're out of order, you can tell you're out of order because there's no peace. Your body is in bad condition. I think I'm in better health now than I was in five, five years ago. And I'm doing something that I enjoy doing. So you have to be anointed for the position. And the anointing for the position, you can tell because it fits with who you are. The word priest is very significant. It's the one that officiates. It's the one that, um, in fact, you could be a, a, a priest in this in this case, which is Hebrew 35, 48, if you want to look it up in the concordance. 
You can be a priest, and it also means that you're, you can be a layman. So I want you to think about this. You're anointed a layman, but there's also a chief priest. I often tell people that you have to have mentors or jetnas, or depending on how you look at it, different language, same, same intent. But you have to have people who have experience over you. You have to. If you don't, you're out of order. You have to have people that you walk with. Uh, in this case, Moses was over Aaron and under God. It's God, Moses, Aaron. Aaron being really the subject matter here. You have to have people you work with. You're going to see that here in a minute, that Aaron is working with some people. The 12 princes. I think I'm going to show that here. I'm not sure. So what I love about God is that this is true whether it's the priesthood because the priesthood is type and shadow for any leader in any field. So you have to be anointed. You're As a priest, you're training to be chief. Right now, Moses is chief. <laughs> and as crazy as it sounds, Aaron is the layman. Because it is. He's new at this as well. And then finally, there's the priest office. The priest office is the one that mediates the service. Puts on the regalia. So if you're in business, your regalia may be a tie, cotton shirt, suit. I need to get back to doing that maybe. I don't know. But I don't, I don't miss dressing like that. But um, may some, be something I need to consider. Uh, and they do the works of that office, whatever that office is. In this case, we're talking about the Levitical priest. Now, I know I confuse people sometimes. I'm not trying to because I jump back and forth because I want people to understand that this is not all about you being a pastor, teacher, evangelist prophet, apostle. This is, these are principles, these are statutes for living in this world system and bringing about a better system, which is the kingdom of heaven. And these are the rules of the kingdom of God. Now, what isn't shown here is the purpose the purpose of doing, doing things this way is right here. See, because the Levitical priests are encamped around the tabernacle of the congregation in the middle of all these tribes. There's a certain amount of equality there because they're all um, beholden to the tabernacle of the congregation, to the overall group, to the, to, the, to the combined, to the statutes that apply to each and every one of the tribes. So what does that mean? It means that Moses is doing the best job he can to teach them something before they get to Canaan and that something is uni, uh, unity behind principles of the kingdom of God. What the Jewish community calls the Torah. Leviticus chapter 10 shows this, in, starting in verse 8, he says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink thou, nor thy sons with thee, when, so that means, that in, when he says when, that means, it doesn't mean that you can't drink strong drink, it doesn't mean you can't drink 
uh, at all. It just says, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, in other words, don't serve God drunk, or you'll die. In our case, you'll lose your reputation. Can you imagine a pastor standing on stage who's, who's inebriated, telling everyone the importance of being sober, sober-minded? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. You'll die. You'll lose your reputation. And it also does damage to the kingdom of heaven. A statue forever throughout your generation. So this has nothing to do with Old Testament and New Testament. This is a statue throughout your generations. Verse 10. And that ye may put and. So do that and. Put difference between the holy and unholy. Show the difference between the unclean and the clean. In verse 11, and, number one, may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. That is the purpose of doing things in order teaching people these statues by the hand of Moses. Now, the hand of Moses, I really need to spend a whole video on, which I'm not going to do that because that is not the purpose of this. The hand of Moses is amazing. But it, a synopsis of that, the hand of Moses, is, is the, the job of the chief priest is, or should be, to set boundaries for all the tribes to follow so that there can be a bounty for all. Um, uh, you know, creating an atmosphere, um, I want to say of physical boundaries. You know, it's, it's when you have an effective kingdom, or what, or a church, and I think the Jewish community is very good at this. I think the Armenian community is very good at this because I spent some time with one of the sharpest young brothers I think I've ever met in my life, in, uh, uh, who's Armenian, and the way he governed his uh, team was the kingdom of God. And I'm sure he still does. I, I just don't have a relationship with him. But the way he governed, I enjoyed learning from him because I would watch him. You know, I would watch, I was more interested in him than I was in, in, what, he was, in what he was doing. And I, and I looked at his enthusiasm. I looked at his family structure. I, I, I looked at uh, who ate at his home. I looked at who he traveled with, and he took care of his sister. Uh, he took care of honoring his mother and his and his father on both sides, uh, and he raised up people to lead, and he he put them on his back if necessary. Great. To me, one of the, one of the one of the greatest examples of to me of someone taking seriously the kingdom of God um, and dem and demonstrating what the kingdom of heaven looks like. So, what am I saying? If you understand the hand of Moses and you respect the hand of Moses and you love God for putting these boundaries around us, and we operate according to these statutes, it means the kingdom of heaven is, God is magnified, the kingdom of heaven is fruitful. That's the hand of Moses. Now there's a lot more, so there'll be an order of things, chapter 3, and we're gonna, it looks like we're going to be in this for just a minute. Hey, listen, if this these videos are helpful to you, I can use your help. Be fantastic. 
Uh, please share these videos if you believe they're, he they're, they're uh, helpful. And then also, please feel free to donate. Uh, we can, I can always use help and bring it. I'm going to do this anyway because I love doing it. But if it brings you value, please. Uh, cash app, dollar sign, Mr. Paul Dozier. Cash app, dollar sign, Mr. Paul Dozier. And God bless you.